Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Jeremy Coburn. Jeremy is a PhD candidate in linguistics with a concentration on African languages and linguistics at Indiana University in the United States. He's a field linguist with an emphasis in phonetics and phonology, interested in typologically uncommon speech sounds, language conservation, and the description of East African languages. His dissertation research focuses on the phonetic and phonological description of Hatsa, an endangered language isolate spoken in Tanzania, using traditional linguistic fieldwork and novel instrumental methodologies. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy as he gives his talk, Field Report, Update on Hatsa Language Vitality. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining me for this presentation entitled Field Report, Update on Hadza Language Vitality. In 2019, I delivered a preliminary talk for the Rift Valley Network webinar series, which I called a critical evaluation of Hadza language use and maintenance efforts, reporting on preliminary observations made during a pre-dissertation trip among the Hadza people in the Mongola area of Hadza land. In many ways, this talk is a follow-up and augmentation of that previous talk, adding to it more nuanced cross-sectional data from additional time spent with more Hadza communities. I fairly recently returned from a stint of dissertation fieldwork conducted in Tanzania with the Hadza people, funded in large part by a Fulbright-Hayes DDRI fellowship. This presentation is a small product of that fieldwork and hopes to provide current information regarding the status of language use among many Hadza communities. I begin, of course, with an important caveat. Any big picture statement on language vitality, especially from an external source such as a researcher, is of necessity a generalization. As will be highlighted during this talk, intercommunity differences are substantial. However, variations in vitality are considered when making statements regarding the language as a whole. To start, I would like to lay out our, traje our trajectory for this talk. Though many of you are familiar with Hadza, I will provide some background information on the language and its speakers. It is especially important to get a sense for the unique context in which Hadza speakers find themselves to understand the factors which weigh on the linguistic situation. We then will briefly discuss commonly used metrics for evaluating language vitality, followed by the methodology and sites of data collection for this study. Then I will break down my Hadza vitality ass assessment based upon the UNESCO nine major evaluative factors of language vitality. Each factor will be discussed and evaluated separately before being summarized at the end. Finally, I will conclude this presentation by briefly reporting on ongoing and proposed language maintenance efforts, both within and without the Hadza community and propose future directions. The Hadza language is an autochthonous language spoken in the area surrounding Lake Easi of Northern Tanzania, indicated in gray on the map on the right and pointed to by the red arrow. Hadza is unique in the Tanzanian Rift in that it predates all other extant languages except Sandawe in the region. Although once classified among the reputed Khoisan language phylum, it is generally believed that Hadza is a language isolate, unrelated to any other known language. Hadza is widely known for its large consonant inventory and use of cross-linguistically less common speech sounds such as clicks, ejectives, and lateral obstruents. Given the time depth in which Hadza speakers have been in contact with speakers of unrelated languages, the Hadza language is marked with substantial lexical borrowings in core as well as peripheral vocabulary, and it shares some features identified by Kiesling et al. 2008 as being common to the proposed Tanzania, Tanzania Rift Valley Sprachbund. The official Tanzanian census does not include ethnicity. Consequently, Hadza population estimates are not very conclusive. However, Brian Wood, an anthropologist who has worked extensively with the Hadza, estimated that there were approximately 1,200 Hadza people, or Hadzabe, 10 years ago in 2013 when he took his census. Even then, determining who is ethnically Hadza and who is not is not always straightforward. Interethnic marriage is not uncommon, both historically and today. Especially in the Mongol area, there are many community members who are ethnically non-Hadza, speak limited Hadza language, but reside in Hadza camps. This makes population numbers problematic at best, and more research is needed in this regard. 
Pods of people reside in semi-permanent to permanent camps, ranging in size from a handful of individuals to over 100, as well as established villages. There is a high degree of transiency and interaction between communities and throughout the range of, that the Hadza reside. Traditionally, the Hadza have subsisted as hunter-gatherers, while foraging remains an integral part of Hadza life, culture, and identity. Few, if any Hadza, but few, if any Hadza, live exclusively on foraging today. Depending on the season, most Hadza will obtain a portion of their diet from foraging game meat, berries, honey, and tubers. The other portion, however, comes from agricultural products such as maize, beans, and rice, often purchased by community leadership and distributed, or obtained from researchers or non-governmental organizations. In many camps and villages, Hadza individuals have begun engaging in, in agriculture and animal husbandry. Conditions though vary by lo location. In the Mongol area, for example, which has seen environmental change and extensive loss of game animals due to a booming onion farming industry, Hadza people often seek income-based employment as day laborers in the onion fields. With its, uh, with its proximity to major roads en route to the Ngorongoro Conservation Area and Serengeti National Park, the Hadza community in the Mongola area specifically engage in substantial cultural tourism, hosting thousands of tourists per year. As I reported in my 2019 presentation, this tourism has been the impetus for linguistic and cultural commodification among the Mongola Hadza community. Cultural tourism also occurs in other Hadza areas, but is much more regulated and its effect less substantial. Interethnic inter Interaction is commonplace in the Tanzanian Rift. The Hadza regularly interact with Iraq, Datoga, Isanzu, and Skuma neighbors, among others, both in the villages and even in their camps. Consequently, multilingualism is the norm. Essentially, all Hadza today are minimally bilingual in Hadza and Swahili. Some also speak Sukuma, especially west of Lake Eyasi, or Isanzu, or Datoga. To my knowledge, no attempt has been made to objectively assess Hadza language vitality using widely accepted vitality metrics. Ethnologue, which utilizes the expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale, or EGIDS, which I will explain it more in a moment, classifies Hadza as endangered, while the UNESCO Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger classifies it as vulnerable. Neither source specifies, however, what data are considered or what metrics are employed to determine their classification. Since Michael Krauss's 1992 famous World's Languages in Crisis, the field of linguistics has focused intently on understanding, assessing, and mitigating language endangerment, a crucial component of which is assessing the status of language use for the thousands of languages currently at risk. Support for linguistic diversity has continued to rise since that time, prompting the United Nations to declare this the decade of indigenous languages. Several metrics have been developed to allow for objective vitality assessment. The Graded International Disruption Scale, or GIDS, proposed by Fishman 1991, focuses particularly on the transmission of language from one generation to the next as the central vehicle for language maintenance, as well as the domains in which a language is used. Though useful, linguists have readily pointed out GIDS has short, GIDS has shortcomings in overlooking other important factors in maintaining a language, such as speakers' attitudes toward the language and degree of documentation. The expanded graded international, sorry, the expanded graded intergenerational disruption scale, or eGIDS, was thus developed by Simons and Lewis 2010 to further refine the system and allow for more fine-grained categorization particularly within the safe and extinct ends of the spectrum. In 2003, a UNESCO ad hoc expert group on endangered languages produced a metric for assessing language vitality by identifying, by identifying nine major evaluative factors of language vitality. Their metric is, in many regards, similar to the GIDS system, except that it includes crucial factors missed in the earlier system, such as, languages at, such as language attitudes, language policies, and amount and quality of language documentation. The present study adopts this system, this last system, for evaluating Hadza language vitality. 
the following are the nine factors identified by UNESCO and addressed here. One, intergeneral language transmission, intergenerational language transmission. To what degree are children learning the language? Two, absolute number of speakers. Three, proportion of speakers within the total population. Four, trends in existing language domains. Five, response to new domains and media. Six, whether materials exist for language education and literacy. Seven, governmental and institutional languages and policies, including official status and use. In other words, how does the government view the language and to what degree is it supported by the relevant governing body? Eight, community members' attitudes toward their own language. And nine, the amount and quality of language documentation. Now, each of these factors, excluding the total number of speakers metric, obviously, is graded on a scale of zero to five. Five is safe, meaning the language is spoken by all generations with uninterrupted transmission. Then there is also a five minus, stable yet threatened, in which all generations speak the native language, but one or more dominant languages are used within some domains of communication. Four, unsafe, indicates that most, but not all, children or families speak the language as their first language, but it may be restricted to, for example, the home. Three, definitely endangered. Intergenerational transmission has largely ceased and the youngest speakers are of the parental generation. The parents may speak to their children in the language, but the children are passive bilinguals and do not typically respond in the native language. Two, severely endangered. The language is only spoken by grandparents and, old, and the older generation. Parents may be passive bilingual, but do not use it with their children. One, critically endangered. The youngest speakers are in the great grandparental generation. The language, though remembered by the older generation, is not used for communication. And finally, zero means extinct. There is no one who can speak or remember the language. Although imperfect, these are the factors and metrics utilized for this study. To give some context for the methodology behind this presentation, as I previously mentioned, I spent nine months conducting dissertation research in Tanzania, spending an extensive amount of time in multiple Hadza communities east of Lake Ayasi in three of the four community recognized Hadza areas, namely Mangola, Tliika, and Siponga, to the east of Lake Ayasi. This study draws on general field observations and unstructured interviews both within, both with individuals as well as larger groups, including whole camps. I personally visited 15 Hadza communities made up of 11 Hadza camps, which are indicated on this map to the right with red markers. These are the Hadza camps and four villages with a mixed ethnic population these are represented by the yellow circles on this map. There are two significant populations of Hadza that I was unable to personally visit, Kipamba at the southwestern end of Lake Ayasi and Sungu and surrounding areas on the west side of the lake. I received anecdotal report from, from community members who have been there, but because I could not personally verify the situation, I did not include that information in this report. All right, so the first factor is intergenerational language transmission, the most commonly used factor in assessing language vitality. Are children learning the language? This is a central component of determining the health of a language, and it is, in fact, regarding language transmission where we are currently seeing a shift from what has always been reported for Hadza to the current status. All previous reports on Hadza have indicated relative stability with Hadza children learning Hadza as their first language. However, during my fieldwork in the community, I have observed and community members have bemoaned to me a nascent shift in language use throughout the Hadza community, a recent disruption in intergenerational transmission. Using the UNESCO six degrees of endangerment as an evaluative metric, I will report on the status of language use in 11 Hadza camps and four villages in which Hadza reside. In two of the camps in which I resided, called Hukumako and Sedaiko, which on this map on the right are marked in green. 
they are close to each other and in a relatively remote location. Uh, the language transmission I have ranked as a five minus, stable yet threatened. In these two camps, all ages speak almost exclusively Hadza in camp between all ages. The young children with whom I interacted spoke primarily Hadza and would respond in Hadza even when addressed in Swahili. Parents spoke only Hadza to their children in all the interactions that I observed in these two camps. However, in eight of the 11 camps, I would describe the intergenerational transmission as four unsafe, shown in yellow with yellow markers. Uh, the, and this is to somewhat varying degrees. It is in these camps where the shift is most apparent. Essentially, all speakers are currently bilingual in Hadza and, and Swahili, but children under the age of eight years old are now speaking primarily Swahili between themselves, between age mates, and in response to older speakers. The most common comment I heard in these camps was adult speakers saying that these children are now Waswahili or Swahili children. They can speak Hadza, but Swahili is their primary language of communication. Even when older speakers talk to them in Hadza, they respond primarily in Swahili. There is some variation between camps in how significant this shift is. For example, in one remote camp called Sengele, which is near the two green camps on the map, the yellow marker nearest to the green markers on the map. Most children understand Swahili, but prefer to speak Hadza. However, there are a few children, but an increasing amount, that prefer Swahili and only speak Hadza occasionally. Notably, the parents of the Swahili preferential children are young and have attained some level of education. One camp near Mangola village at the upper right side, I have labeled a three definitely endangered and shown in red as a red marker and is likely the largest present, camp, present Hadza camp in existence. It is a permanent settlement in the middle of onion fields with a drilled source of water. In this camp, children below the age of eight do not speak Hadza and most do not understand it beyond basic vocabulary. As an illustrative anecdote, one day I was sitting beneath an acacia tree with some Hadza children. A weaver bird flew up into the tree above us. I pointed to it and said to the children, Chodako, meaning it is a weaver bird in Hadza. One girl around six years old responded to me in Swahili, you they see a Chodako, Nindegi, or that's not a Chodako, the Hadza word for the, the bird. It is Ndege, the Swahili word for generally bird. Children in this camp will occasionally use Hadza greetings, but they do not speak the language fluently, as illustrated by this example. In all four of the villages, so these are the established villages, where many Hadza people reside, but there's a mixed ethnic population, the status is also a three, definitely endangered. The parental generation are bilingual in Hadza and Swahili, but the children do not speak Swahili. In the villages, even teenagers have very limited Hadza proficiency and would often be embarrassed to even speak Hadza with me, for example. Now, there are numerous potential causes for this recent shift in Hadza language use across, across most Hadza communities. Here, I list only a few based on my own observations. Since 1990, the education rate among Hadza children has increased significantly. Due to the distances from Hadza camps to schools, many Hadza children are enrolled in boarding schools and thus are not in the community for the majority of the year. The Hadza students represent a minority in these schools and have little opportunity to use Hadza. Consequently, when the children do return home on holidays, it is reported that their proficiency in Hadza has atrophied substantially. And linked to this increase in education rates, I have observed that the young childbearing generation, most of whom have minimally several years of formal education at some of these schools and are bilingual in Swahili and Hadza, prefer to mix both languages, both among themselves and to their children. And so you will see that most of this generation are speaking a lot of Swahili within camp between each other and to their children. In several camps, especially the large red camp that I described. 
there are a number of inter-ethnic couples, most often a non-Hadza man who is married to and has children with a Hadza woman residing inside the camp. In many of these instances, the non-Hadza man speaks little to no Hadza, and so Swahili is the primary language of communication in the home. A secondary effect of this situation is that it is not uncommon for Hadza community meetings and other forms of communication to be conducted solely in Swahili to ac accommodate non-speakers, further restricting the domains of use of the language. These are just a few of the possible sources of disruption that I identified. So for these reasons, I'm classifying the intergenerational transmission as presently four unsafe in most camps, though with a foreseeable shift toward three definitely endangered and in some cases uh, locations already are, are in this three uh, level. For example, the camp that I identified and the, the villages. Given what I observed in nearly all instances, barring maintenance efforts, a rapid decline in intergenerational transmission is likely imminent. The second evaluative factor is absolute number of speakers. This one is tricky for the same reason that population measures are problematic. There is no definitive population data for the Hadza community, nor has there been an attempt to identify number of speakers relative to the total population. However, assuming Brian Wood's 2013 census data of roughly 1,200 ethnic Hadza individuals, there is likely a commensurate number of speakers. Confidently assuming that the population has increased since 2013, the number of speakers is presumably over 1,200 today. Especially given the recent shift in language use, a more detailed study investigating numbers of, number of speakers is needed, but it was beyond the scope of my dissertation research. Since the absolute number of speakers is unknown, it is also impossible to know the exact proportion of ethnic Hadza who speak the language. Nevertheless, I would classify this metric as a four, unsafe, which UNESCO defines as nearly all speak the language at this juncture. Further research, however, is needed to verify this. Factor number four, trends in existing language domains, where, with whom, and the range of topic, topics for which a language is used directly affects whether or not it will be transmitted to the next generation. To generalize this factor for the language as a whole, I would classify the current situation as between a four, multilingual parity, and a three, dwindling domains, leaning more towards the three side depending on the location. And dwindling domains is defined by UNESCO as the non-dominant language loses ground, parents begin to use the dominant language at home in their everyday interactions with their children, and children become semi-speakers of their own language or receptive bilinguals. Parents and older members of the community tend to be productively bilingual in the dominant and indigenous languages. They understand and speak both and bilingual children may exist in families where the indigenous language is actively used. Today, essentially all Hadza speakers are minimally bilingual in Swahili as well. And young parents are beginning to use primarily Swahili, even in camps, which was once a stronghold of use. Hence why I say this is more three dwindling domains than multilingual parity. In addition to losing existing language domains, the Hadza language is not currently being used in any new domains, such as media, education, or government, even largely within the community. For example, uh, portable solar-powered radios have become quite common in Hadza camps in recent years. However, Swahili music, Swahili music or other ethnic languages like Sukuma, for example, is another popular one is the only music available for use in these radios. And so you hear a lot of this music being played in camps. In fact, you hear more of this music being played in camps every day than you do traditional Hadza music being produced. This factor is therefore classified as zero or inactive. There are no new domains for the language currently. Regarding materials for language education and literacy, this is one of the few factors for which there are plans in motion to address. Currently, I classify this factor as a zero, meaning no orthography is available or materials are available to the community. Though I do put an asterisk here. The Hadza community in general is aware 
that an orthography was developed by the late James Woodburn, who was an anthropologist who spent many years studying the Hadza. However, very few know the or actually know the orthography and even fewer use it. A similar orthography, kind of based on that original orthography, was used by Bonnie Sands and others to produce a book of Hadza stories and songs. Another, another orthography was uh, completely different from the other two, was created by Kirk Miller and Maria Manuire, who herself is a Hadza community member, but that orthography is largely unknown, unknown to, nor is it used by the community. In Tanzania, Swahili is the official national language, the regional lingua franca, and the language of education, commerce, and government. No indigenous languages are officially recognized or protected under the Tanzanian constitution. Thus, for factor seven, governmental and institutional languages and policies, including official status and use, Hadza is classified as a two, meaning active assimilation is occurring. In other words, the government encourages assimilation to the dominant language. There is no protection for minority languages. Additionally, even community internal events are shifting towards the use of Swahili to accommodate non-speakers as I described before. Factor eight, community members' attitudes toward their own language. Due to the limitations of my research, I was unable to utilize a formal survey of language attitudes. However, every speaker with whom I spoke about the language during this study expressed the importance of the language to the community's identity, culture, and future. They lamented the current shift in language use among the younger generation towards Swahili, wishing to see it maintained and promoted, though not knowing how to do it then, themselves. I would classify this factor as a five. Uh, I would classify this factor as a five. All members support language maintenance, but even in a small community like the Hadza, it is impossible for me to know whether every community member supports language maintenance. So I classified it as a four here. Most members support language maintenance. Finally, amount and quality of documentation. The level of documentation I would say is a two fragmentary. It is however improving. UNESCO defines this rating as follows. There are some grammatical sketches, word lists, and texts useful for, lingu for limited linguistic research, but with inadequate coverage. Audio and video recordings of varying quality with or without any annotation may exist. Grammatical, grammatical descriptions of Hadza do exist, such as Bonnie Sands' 2013 preliminary chapters on Hadza phonology and phonetics, morphology, tonology, and syntax. But a complete grammatical sketch is currently not available. available. Kirk Miller and Maria Muanyawire, with others, have very valuably put together a manuscript Hadza dictionary but it is not yet published. It's currently in a manuscript form. I say that the level of documentation is improving thanks to the massive contributions of Richard Griscom, Andrew Harvey, and their local Hadza researchers in creating an archive of Hadza language and cultural material. And hopefully too, my dissertation will add to this ongoing effort for documentation and description of Hadza. Now to summarize, to summarize this vitality assessment, here's a table showing each evaluative factor and the values I have assigned it with their corresponding label. Importantly, the ways in which each of these factors weigh on language vitality is not equal and differs for each language. The values are not intended to be simply added up and assigned a grade based on the sum. For reference though, if a language was assigned a value for each factor minus the absolute number of speakers factor, a total of 40 points would be possible. Assuming that factor one is currently a four and root to becoming three or three in some instances, and factor four is largely a three with pockets of four where multilingual parity still occurs, uh, the total score for this assessment would be 19 out of 40, just as reference. So with all these factors taken into account, the Hadza language as a whole is currently, by my uh, account, vulnerable according to the uh, UNESCO way of grading it. Though with some communities, I would argue are actually in the definitely endangered zone. Vulnerable is defined by UNESCO as most but not all children or families of a particular community speak their parental language as their first language. 
but this may be restricted to specific social domains, such as the home, where children interact with their parents and grandparents. Def definitely endangered, on the other hand, is defined as the language is no longer being learned as the mother tongue by children in the home. The youngest speakers are thus of the parental generation. At this stage, parents may still speak their language to their children, but their children do not typically respond in the language. This is certainly true in some communities, such as the large camp in Mongola and within villages, but not yet generally for the language as a whole, given the other camps uh, in which I surveyed. According for reference to the IGID scale, these would be equivalent to 6B threatened. So as I've said, I will give this assessment a, a, as being four vulnerable. The equivalent in EGIDs would be a 6B threatened um, with some within a seven shifting assessment based on my survey. It is important to note that there are community internal and external language conservation efforts being made. The community has increasingly become aware of the situation and desires language maintenance. In the course of my field work, I repeatedly heard community members express interest in for example, orthography de development and literacy efforts. They have brainstormed and discussed with me and among themselves about the implementation of some kind of community-led education and, and community leadership hopes to work in partnership with interested parties, such as Carbon Tanzania and the Durogo Fund who are relevant in uh, the area to raise awareness about the need for linguistic and cultural conservation. Ongoing research, including this study, as well as that being done by Andrew Harvey and Richard Griscom, aim to address factors six and nine, previously described by, by improving the state of documentation and creating materials that may be used by the, the Hadza community for literacy and education purposes. In a few locales, Hadza community members have already begun taking steps to address cultural loss and this language shift, in which I've described. For example, one man, one Hadza man named Bagayo has independently begun building a structure in Kideru camp, which is pictured here, uh, which he hopes to use as a gathering place for cultural education and eventually language instruction. Bagayo has recognized that certain components of the culture and language are not being transmitted to the next generation, and he hopes to combat the situation. Finally, looking toward future directions based upon this current assessment of language vitality, additional research will allow for even greater clarity into the situation. Focused population and number of speaker assessments, structured interviews, and long-term observation would improve the quality of the evaluation put forth here. Expanded geographical scope is also important to understand the situation west of Lake Eyasi. For example, uh, from anecdotal reports, it is said that the Hadza population to the west is especially influenced by the Sukuma language and culture. To what extent that affects Hadza language transmission is an open question requiring further investigation. With the nascent shift towards Swahili among children in many Hadza communities, the Hadza language is on the cusp of witnessing substantial decline within this decade, unless steps are taken by the community, linguists, and other stakeholders. Potential opportunities for language maintenance include increasing awareness of the situation within the Hadza and linguistics communities, supporting joint community-based initiatives, and improving the amount and quality of language documentation and description. Finally, I would like to conclude by thanking the numerous Hadza community members, fellow researchers, especially Bonnie Sands, Andrew Harvey, and Richard Griscom, and other involved parties who contributed in one way or another to this research all of whom cannot be mentioned here by name. Thank you. Here are my references, and I will welcome any questions or comments at this time. Um, so, hi, Jeremy. Um, I guess uh, this part of the uh, talk, the webinar, is a little bit different from uh, our regular webinars because um, uh, for work reasons, you couldn't be present at the actual talk. So what we saw was a pre-recording, and now what we are getting is uh, a response to recorded questions and answers from those people who watch the pre-recording. Uh, so I guess the first thing uh, that uh, was mentioned right after uh, your talk finished in the discussion section was Bonnie Sands' uh, just said thank you for giving 
um, some information on, uh, well, first of all, generally on the language dynamic, uh, but also on uh, grassroots revitalization efforts uh, that sort of photo towards the end of, um, of the homemade uh, language revitalization classroom. Uh, I think was was really exciting, and that was something that she wanted to point out. I don't know if you have anything uh, that you'd like to add uh, to that point right now. Yeah, um, I could definitely add that as I was there working and doing this for these nine months that I was there in the Hudson community, as I started to identify some of these things, particularly the, the you know risks that were, we were starting to see for language vitality as well as the steps that the community itself was starting to take independent of what I was doing, um, were things that I started to notice and I started to realize this is something that needs to be disseminated. So I really appreciated this forum for which I, through which I can disseminate this information about kind of what we're starting to see in the context of language use among the Hadza across certain areas of Hadza land, but also the way that the community has recognized these things and independently started to address them. I think there's there's some good news in that, in addition to the somewhat, you know, sad news of, of other things that, that I reported on. Right. Um, I had a comment directly after that um, in the question and answer section. Um, some of what you were talking about, uh, and of course, a, sort of a large sort of factor that defines everyday Hadza life, was uh, this interconnection of tourism and daily Hadza life and the commodification of the language. I wondered uh, in the discussion section, I, I wondered how tourism could help with language maintenance efforts in a Hadza context. Is there any way that we could think up a way or ways in which that would happen? Or are we already seeing it? It's a great question. Uh, I really appreciate that question. It's something that I've thought about. I've kind of been asking myself as well. I don't have an immediate answer as to, okay, what techniques could we use? What uh, you know, uh, types of strategies could we use to take advantage of what is happening in the tourism industry um, to also benefit the community in terms of language conservation? Um, I've, I mentioned in a previous iteration of, of me re reporting on the language use. And I thought about presenting it here, but I didn't, um, that the fact that language is kind of interacting in interesting ways with tourism, where the language itself is being used as a way to signal, uh, to kind of get commodified as some kind of way to sell Hadza-ness and the state of being of Hadza, particularly in uses of clicks, to where we're starting to see, this is very common, and I was continue to see it evident in many camps uh, that are involved, especially in Mongola, who are involved with tourism. And that's the, in, the insertion of clicks in words that did not previously have clicks. So the most common example of that is the greeting, Mtana, which now there's being produced as Mkana and putting an alveolar click where the T once was, uh, where the alveolar stop once was. And I, so I noticed that the first time I was there in 2018, and I noticed it again this time. In, in fact, I've noticed that it's expanded to other words as well. So like, and this is very common, especially between uh, the tour guides and the people as they're interacting with tourists. And so they'll be like, uh, and they'll start putting clicks in, which is like brother or relative putting clicks there as well. So there's just a lot of other places where they're starting to insert these clicks. So it makes an interesting dynamic where the, what was once viewed as, you know, the clicks are what make Hadza unusual. And there's been reports that, you know, they were a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that their language seemed strange to outsiders, particularly their neighbors. And that it was a, set of, a place of marginalization within the community has now kind of shifted to being a, a sense of pride of our language is different, and therefore, you know, we have these clicks, and it's interesting. So there's definitely ways in which tourism is affecting language use um, that I think definitely warrants further investigation, because I think there's some really interesting stuff there that I didn't particularly get to focus on. But I do wonder myself if there are ways, because 
we see this in indigenous cultures in many places where they're interacting with cultural tourism, where in some ways tourism affects and changes culture and language, but in other ways it can also cement that and make it more uh, concrete and a reason to keep it going. Uh, this was something I often heard among actually the Hadza themselves would often talk about this. Can you imagine going out on a, a hunt with tourists or just otherwise and speaking in Swahili to each other as you're hunting some animal? Imagine you're seeing something and instead of saying Tongoko or Nana, you're saying Kud, uh, Tandala. Uh, saying it only in Swahili and, they, and immediately their response is oh no, 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 we can't can you imagine if that's the way things were and they were immediately like terrified of such a situation where their language was completely replaced by Swahili so it does uh, bring up interesting possibilities that I think should be explored um, because you know the situation of tourism is ongoing that's not going to change um, and so finding a way to do that to benefit the, the language conservation is definitely something that should be considered and, and thought through thoroughly. This uh, Hadza tourist register, I'll coin <laughs> that term now, yeah. um, is, is just so cool. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you sort of bringing it to my attention. I think that there's a whole PhD dissertation there. Like it's, it's so interesting. And I think it's one of the most salient examples I think that we, that we can see. Um, Absolutely. I, I imagine, I imagine driving down into Mongola one day um, in my own sort of, yeah, in my own sort of head, and uh, sort of pulling into the into the tourism office and seeing sort of built on the side of that some sort of classroom where where tourists could stop in and get a lesson by somebody uh, one day. I think that that would be really cool. Do a uh, Hadza lesson before or after you do all those other things on your uh, on your Hadza tourist uh, list. But of course, um, yeah, I'm interested to see uh, where that goes uh, in the yeah, future. And the community, like I said, is, is aware that there are possibilities and they've themselves already been thinking of mm. things like this, things like what you're suggesting. Um, and they, it is all part of this really big sense that they've got right now within the community that we want to take ownership of our language. They're seeing that their ownership of the language is starting to dwindle in some ways and that it's being exploited by other people for their benefit, for their gain, particularly tourist groups, tourist you know, outfits, why shouldn't we be in charge of what is being disseminated about our language and ha having control, one control, but also benefit gain from that, which I think is a really interesting narrative that's going on right now within the community. Idea of linguistic sovereignty, very cool. Um, yeah. Helen asked if you were familiar with um, the audio uh, translations of parts of the Bible uh, in Hadza. Yes, I am. Actually, I think it's funny that I didn't bring that up um, as part of what is available. Um, my list of, of resources of the language that are available was certainly not exhaustive. Um, I just kind of was highlighting a few things and totally forgot actually about this, but it, it, I am aware. So. I'm not sure if I'm aware of exactly what she's talking about. Um, I'm aware of a, so for example, I think it's, there's a website called hadzabebible.com. If I, something like that. Um, if you Googled Hadza Bible, there'd be a webpage and there's a bunch of recordings of all sorts of stories and exact translations and things like that, that are done just as audio for people to listen to as well as songs and things like that. And I, I was very familiar with that. Um, had conversations with Mariam Wanyawire, who, was, who contributed to it, as well as other community members who contributed to it. Um, and then also virtual or you know, remote conversation with some of the people who were involved with that. But the one that, that Helen brings up, there, I did hear one day uh, people talking about Bible translations that were going on that I thought seemed to be independent of the one I was already familiar with. Okay. Um, I wasn't aware if that was a written translation or not i just know that i heard young people talking about some of the trying to they were they were joking and laughing about how you would interpret or translate specific phrases from swahili into 
into Hadza and found some funny reasons why people were using strange combinations of things. But that's as far as I was familiar with that. That's quite cool. Yeah, the uh, the task of uh, the task of not just translating uh, the uh, language of the Bible into Hadza, but also like the universe uh, of the Bible into Hadza. Yeah. You make it locally relevant, and that's something that yes. people talk about, right? Very yeah. cool. Um, Ivan uh, Trace uh, brought up sort of a general question, and it was a really meaty one. Um, it was sort of overarching it was the topic was bigger than just uh your presentation uh and sort of the 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 meat of the question was are there good examples from the african continent which show that literacy programs language maintenance programs or language documentation and these kind of things have is there any evidence are there any good examples from the continent that have, that show that this kind of work has actually slowed down or reversed language loss. And I sort of chimed in after that and I said, well, Felix Emeka writes about how literacy is problematic when we when we sort of hold it up as the modality of focus for our efforts. And uh, I'll let sort of the stuff that he's written speak for itself because I think it's very good and it's very specific. And then Bonnie um, mentions, well, you know, we've come so far uh, from a point of view that when she was working with Hadza people in the 90s, older people would, would tell her that when they went into town, people would pester them and ask uh, them to show them their tales because from what they had heard, uh, Hadza people were like monkeys and the language wasn't a real language. So some very like damaging stereotypes. And Bonnie had said, well, this sort of idea of showing that Hadza can be written down like any other language and it can be treated like any other language, have a literary tradition, et cetera, um, can really go a long way in showing people that Hadza is a language like any other language. So she really, so Bonnie really sort of wanted to drive home, well, this is really early days when we talk about, you know, projects, revitalization projects, academic projects to, you know, uh, to work with the Hadza community. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Do you have any, do you have any sort of examples? So Yvonne wondered if there were any good examples. Do you know of any, or do you have any more sort of general thoughts on this kind of, this kind of work with, with Hadza? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a very poignant question. And my first immediate response to the question is that, so for me, for what I've been reporting on, um, the conversations that I had with community members, they brought up to me the literacy, the, the desire for literacy efforts, um, independent of me saying it. I, you know, I said I was a linguist. I said I was interested in the language. Um, and then it always, you know, evolved into conversation about whether the children are speaking the language, what the status of language use among children is today, and then them, you know, readily giving suggestions as to what could possibly be done. And there are a number of people, many, many people who brought up to me that they would like to see literacy happen, whether that's, you know, so starting with having a written system and then development of books. And, you know, as far as the person I explained, Bagayo, who wants to see some sort of cultural center slash uh, language instruction school developed in his area, um, they brought up those things independent of me talking about them. So it is something that they desired. Now, of course, there could always be the response that, well, yes, they desire that because of the influence of their extensive interaction with academics and uh, Western education styles and things like that. Um, and that's true. Yeah, uh, obviously, there's influence, external influences there. Um, which are out beyond our control, but that doesn't invalidate their desire for it. So, you know, my immediate response is if that's what they want for their language, language sovereignty is something that I think is extremely important, um, especially in the, in the case of the Hadza, uh, that if that's what they want, they should, of course, have the support of whoever can help them do accomplish the goals that they have for themselves. Um, then to respond to her question of, do we have good examples? Uh, that's a great question, and I'm not sure if I 
can think of any immediately that I could say, yes, this is a clear example of where literacy and orthography and language education is has saved a language from decline or even slowed a language from decline. There's so many dynamic uh, factors involved in language endangerment and uh, the, the atrophying of a language within a community that it's, it would be nigh impossible to say that literacy was the saving factor. Um, I know in conversation with Bonnie that she has some examples of, of, place, of places in Namibia or Botswana where uh, literacy seems to have helped, uh, in, at least contributed in some sense to slowing it. But I'm, I'm, I'm personally not familiar with those examples, and so I can't speak to that. Um, but the one thing that, that Bonnie did bring up and is, would be my response to, as well to this is the value of having literacy and an orthography for the language and books to be able to show within the community as well as to people external to the community is an immeasurable uh, contribution to the, the language sovereignty, to feeling like here is our language, it is something we can hold. And I've, I've heard people, lots of people say this, we want to hold our language in our hand. We want to be able to say, this is our language. This is what it looks like. Um, and so there is definitely a mental thing individually, but also collectively as a community to say, we have ownership of our language. Here are resources available in our language. Um, our language literacy is going to happen and is happening in the Hadza community, regardless of whether that happens in Hadza or not. Swahili, as I explained in my presentation, is going is entering the community at a, at a very rapid rate. And so literacy is happening. And if literacy is happening in Swahili and there is no comparable option in Hadza, then that that uh, that domain of use is not going to be utilized, obviously. And so given the fact that literacy is going to happen, is happening, is already happening, uh, I think that having literacy in Hadza can only help. It can't hurt. It can only help the situation, is my opinion. Cool. I uh, I appreciate uh, getting sort of your thoughts on that. Um, Anna quite uh, asks: Is there any use of Hadza in online communication? It's a good question. Um, I did mention that domains of use, new domains of use. I said are zero, that there are no, it is not being used in new domains of use. And I say that because uh, there, like I mentioned, there is no agreed upon orthography. Um, I've, I have messaged personally in Hadza with a number of people using WhatsApp or text message. And my interactions with those people in message form, in written form, differed because the orthography they were using was different. I knew what they meant just because I kind of have a, you know an idea as to several possible options for representing specific sounds, but they differed. And so them trying to communicate to each other also would have been problematic. I'm not aware of any Hadza who communicate between each other in Hadza uh, online using WhatsApp or whatever. They would, from what I've seen from my own experience, I have seen them communicate only in Swahili um, between themselves. Obviously, I'm not, I can't be familiar with everything that's being produced, but uh, definitely the community in itself does not have an, uh, an agreed upon orthography that everyone uses. Um, and so because of that, they just tend to use Swahili because why, why make it more difficult than it needs to be by trying to communicate in a language that you're not really sure how to write? Um, so I haven't experienced any new domains, online usage of Hadza, except for me trying to communicate with them in Hadza because I enjoy trying to do it for my, for my own benefit of trying to continue to use the language. Right. Um, and I should say that Anna has done uh, some work, uh, has done a lot of uh, research and sort of observation of uh, this sort of, well, this phenomenon uh, in, uh, for Iraq. So she's looked at Iraq Facebook uh, groups and I believe WhatsApp as well. So she's done some talks on this. Uh, really interesting uh, findings, but of course Iraq has a bit of a longer um, tradition of writing 
um, and uh, has a much larger population, uh, many more smartphone users, um, etc. So, I mean, the situation is different, but I, I would, I would, yeah, I think that a chat with uh, with Anna about this would be would be interesting. She, uh, she, uh, she's really at the cutting edge of that. Um, Definitely, and I think it would be interesting uh, if that so smartphone use is still very limited in the Hadza community, but that doesn't mean that it's in, you know not there. There are definitely a number of Hadza people who have smartphones and who regularly interact with WhatsApp um, and Facebook and other things. But besides that, there's also a lot of young Hadza living in camps who are using you know, SMS text message between each other in, inside the camps. And I'm assuming they do that in, in Swahili. I haven't actually personally looked at their messages, but I would assume is an assumption that if they had an agreed upon orthography that everyone was more familiar with, that they would they would start to use Hadza in those communications in written form if they had that as an option. Because those, those communications are happening, but obviously in written form, if they don't know how to write it in Hadza, they just don't. And they just prefer to use the Swahili because they know how to write it. Regarding phone use, I mean, we really shouldn't be surprised. I mean, there's a whole scads of literature on like pastoralists who live uh, sort of in sparsely um, populated areas, live far apart from each other, really um, adopted um, phones and texting uh, almost more than, 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 you know, than, than other groups because they could use it to communicate with each other. You know, uh, more effectively, I could I could see a very similar sort of um, situation uh, with Hadza. Imagine uh, once again uh, going on a Hadza hunt and uh, people texting each other back and forth as to where a certain uh, uh, game yeah. animals where they're moving. It could happen. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Michael uh, asked uh, if you happen to visit or interface at all with the Hadza boarding school in Mongola. Um, and he comments that, you know, maybe having the younger generation educated, uh, I guess in sort of like to a Western or national Tanzanian standard, having the younger generation educated may help the language. Any thoughts on that? Any comments? Yeah, uh, I, I have not seen the, gone to personally visited the Mongol boarding school. Um, I did, I reached out to Maria Manyawire to get a count as to how many Hadza in Mongolia are presently being schooled, because uh, she is involved with paying of fees and things like that, making sure they have uniforms and whatnot. So she's aware of those things. Unfortunately, I didn't get a response before we were able to do this recording, um, but it would be interesting to see what is the number, because I'm not currently aware of how many are being uh, educated in those schools. Um, my um, reaction to, uh, from what I've seen of those who are receiving education is when they come back to the camps, they might greet in Hadza, but then they'll usually laugh and joke among themselves about how, oh, I don't remember how to speak Hadza anymore, like in Swahili, and even with ones who are older who do, who are fluent and, and native uh, Hadza speakers, speaking to them saying, oh yeah, I don't, I don't remember Hadza anymore. We just speak Swahili at school. Um, so from what I've seen, schooling has not helped the situation with the language use. Um, if anything, it's severely uh, diminished language use among the people who I have personally seen receive education. Um, but th that's a, a problematic part of of things that I didn't particularly focus on. I'm just talking about my anecdotal, uh, you know, experiences with people and their conversations about schooling and its effect on language use. And I think that Michael um, probably was thinking in a, in a more roundabout way or a more sort of long-term way as well. Like once the younger generation is educated and 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 can then you know, take up positions in, you know, local leadership positions, for example, you know, and you see more representation um, 
in you know in people who are making decisions and and et cetera, maybe this will help the language in sort of a a longer term term more diffuse way. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a good. Uh, that's a good sort of like right. long, long game sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. That's a really good uh, way to approach this question. Um, I can see where that thought would come. Is like yes, if they're being educated, then they can become advocates. They have a wider thought of of you know well if we make these decisions today in the future it's going to lead to this my interactions with those who have been educated and we talk about this issue of language loss they they definitely have a lot of thoughts of oh these are the things that we could do um, and they see the value of it because they see that they, you know they just have that, that educated way of, of approaching such a problem um, and are the ones who talk about, well, we should have schooling in our, the language, we should have books, we should have all of these things that they're familiar with from a national Tanzanian education perspective. Um, I think in a larger community, that might be true. The problem is, is there is a disconnect between those who are educated and their ability to transmit the language to, not their ability, but the, 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 the tendency for them to transmit the language to their, their children. All of the people who I've seen who were very educated, uh, finished finished seventh grade, uh, seventh grade, I think we'd say in English, uh, uh, or, or form four or you know, finished high school. Right. They would you know, talk about these things, the importance of being advocates for the language. But my experience with their children is their children are the ones who are particularly preferring to speak Swahili, those who have were educated to a you know, upper level, because they have been using Swahili so extensively in their life that now their interactions with their children tend to be primarily in Swahili, mixing with Hadza, but then their children are the ones that I've seen the most. So, for example, there is a specific leader of you know he's a he's a community leader and lives in Sengele, which is the remote. Uh, camp that I talked about in the presentation, and his children are the ones who are speaking Swahili. Even though other children in the camp are speaking Hadza, they tend to respond in Swahili, and it's because he finished Form Four, I think is what it was. Um, and so his his interactions with his children tend to be in Swahili. So I could see the how it would be, uh, you know, a good thought that. Hey, if these people become more educated, it's going to help the language. Um, I think that's possible, but my experience is in the short term at this exact moment, more education is not helping the language in itself become, you know, stay, become, be, be as vital as more language. education um, in the, uh, what's the word, uh, more education uh, in the form of business as usual, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, I appreciate that. Um, I ha had the final question in the uh, Q and A uh, section, and I asked, "What are you optimistic about? What makes you optimistic?" I mean, the picture that you paint, you know, I mentioned I, I thought it was very realistic, um, and sort of as Bonnie had mentioned right at the very outset, these are sort of sobering figures. They really sort of force us to stop and think um, and worry perhaps about the, the long-term viability of Hadza. I want to know what makes you optimistic, what makes you excited regarding the language. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I wish that the report would have been you know, more on the happy tune uh, that that we were seeing, but unfortunately, that's just not the case. You know, as I was not trying to be pessimistic by any means, um, I was definitely trying to be as realistic and give as objective of a, an assessment as I possibly could, aside from what I may feel about the, you know, the viability of Hadza or what I would like to see happen. These were the experiences that I had in the field during this time, as well as, you know, I talked about the, the, perspectives of the community themselves, not just my own personal feelings, but also how they feel about it. Um, but that doesn't mean that there is not things to be excited about. So for example, I gave the example of Bagayo um, and his 
building that he's wanting to create to make a cultural center for uh, cultural language education, or at least just something that, even if not education in the traditional sense that we might think, but some form of what Hadza education might look like. Um, that actually happened right at the very end of my trip. I think it was, I had maybe a month left or something like that. And that was a really cool experience to be able to see that he was doing this independently of what I had done. And he was very excited to get to meet me and get to talk about some of the, the, the issues at hand. Um, so that the fact that he did that independently means that the Hadza community is, is one aware of the situation. And the fact that there's community awareness, um, even before I was talking to people about it, that's a, an encouraging sign. Um, there was also a lot of interest in, in basically every place I visited in being involved in something that to try to help. Um, I never heard someone say, I want my children to speak Swahili because that will give them better opportunities or, you know, it doesn't mean that people don't feel that way. They may, uh, but I never heard it expressed to me that, you know, this isn't as important as them knowing Swahili. Every person I talked to said, we want our children to, to speak Hadza because this is who we are. This is our community. And, you know, if we lose this, we lose a lot. Um, so the fact that the community is aware and wants to be involved in its continuance is, is good. Um, that said, you know, there's those who want to see the language continue, but then when they turn around and talk to their kids behind, you know, in the same breath, are speaking in Swahili to their children. So it's, it's difficult and it's a challenge and that's, that's just the, na the nature of, of language transmission, especially in situations like the Hadza are currently. Um, starts and ends that's, with the speakers. What was that? It starts and ends with the speakers. Yes, it starts and ends with parents particularly, right? Um, and so, but the fact that they were aware to some degree and were interested in what could happen and supportive of that, um, that's something to be encouraged by. The other thing is, um, based on the efforts uh, of, of a number of players, the Dorobo Fund, um, Carbon Tanzania, UCRT, uh, and a number of other players within the Hadza community, the Hadza have a lot more land autonomy than they could have at this moment in time, if there would not have been these land planning things being put into motion. And Carbon Tanzania in particular, in particular is a recent player on the field, and, but they have made a substantial difference within the community and produce a large income for the Hadza community just by living the way they live and protecting the land in which they reside. So this land autonomy that they have the possibility, or they currently are having and have the possibility to continue to have, uh, translates, in my opinion, to the potential they have for language autonomy and language sovereignty. And you know the fact that they can continue to reside in ways that they might want to, traditional ways, instead of just being totally wiped out and moved out by the Sukuma coming in you know, or the Datoga coming in with cattle or whatever it may be, um, that's an encouraging sign. And I think that they're also aware of the big strides that have been made in terms of, of ownership of their land and maintaining their land despite this encroachment. And that kind of sense of pride and excitement that they have for this opportunity, the land opportunity, um, I think makes them realize that they are strong. They, they have the ability to defend themselves. They have the right to defend themselves in terms of their cultural and linguistic and you know, land sovereignty, um, which just enables them. And they've, they seem very excited by that. And so now that they've secured land, they, now they're like, wait, we've conserved land, but now we need to also make sure that our culture and our language is being conserved. And so now is kind of that pivot moment where they are starting to realize, oh, wait, there's other parts of this beyond just losing our land that we could lose if we aren't not aware of what's going on. So it sounds like in your assessment, we're at a very um, crucial inflection point in many ways. Um, and, uh, I guess all we can do is... Uh, 
is uh, keep watching. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for uh, coming and arranging uh, this uh, sort of special rehashed question and answer. Um, I know that everybody would have liked to have um, seen you in person and said hello, but I know that um, you're uh, quite busy now working on your uh, dissertation, which we uh, await uh, excitedly. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, this was really good. And uh, let me uh, do the magic and stitch this together with your pre-recorded uh, talk and we'll uh, post it on YouTube post haste. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, hearing more uh, about your work uh, in the future. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And thank you everyone who attended and for all those who contributed. Uh, this is definitely something that I hope to be a conversation going forward. Um, and so I appreciate all those who were interested and willing to participate.